This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. The men of Britain are stymied. Having crossed over the Irish Sea to rescue their king's sister, and to punish the Irish for having treated her cruelly, the British expedition, led by their gigantic King Bendigidfran, Blessed Raven, finds that the Irish have retreated across an unnavigable river over which there are no bridges. The Britons ask Bendigidfran, What do you advise for a bridge? Nothing, except that he who is chief shall be a bridge. Then was first uttered that saying, and it has become proverbial. And then after he had lain down across the river, planks were placed across him, and his hosts went over across him, motivating Bendigidfran, and the men of the Isle of the Mighty to take up arms and cross the sea is the desire to rescue the king's sister, Branwen, who has sent an unusual SOS to her kinspeople's. True, Branwen's story may seem just a distant cousin to that of the unjustly calumniated Rhiannon in the first branch of the Mabinogi, as well. As to those of the calumniated Constance and patient Griselda, both stories high on the list of medieval the greatest hits, Branwen, however, is neither a faceless pawn of the narrative nor a passive damsel in distress. It has been observed that not only does her name Branwen contain the same key element as her brother's name Bran, Raven, but that the modifying element in Branwen and the adjective a when the feminine inflection of Gwyn White, Bright, Holy, is perhaps a native a counterpart to the borrowed adjective that does the modifying in Bendigide Fran's name. Bendigide a blessed, holy from Latin Benedictus. Hence, it is fair to speculate whether at some point in the development of this story these two characters were twins, or originally one person whom the tradition split in two so as better to represent the contrasting values associated with this complex character package. An outstanding attribute of Branwen's, one assigned to no one else in the four branches, is that Branwen can write, even though her story is supposed to have taken place in a time long before the introduction of writing into the world of the insular Celts. When she is being persecuted and suppressed by the dastardly Irish, who are enforcing an embargo between Britain and Ireland lest news of her imprisonment spread back to her home, Branwen alights upon the bright idea of writing a letter to her brother in which she tells of her plight. She also devises the equally remarkable ploy of training a pet starling to speak like a human, and teaching it how to recognize and find its way to her brother, to whom the bird subsequently delivers the letter, tucked under its wing. It is in response to her missive that Bendigide Fran assembles an army and a fleet. When these approach the Irish coast, it is only Branwen who can properly interpret what the Irish see from the shore. Although they have been treating Branwen with contempt, they know that she is the only one who can make sense of the bewildering and deeply troublesome reports they have received. And indeed, she can. Though it may seem to be so, it is no mountain or forest moving on the water, she explains, it is her gigantic brother, and the masts of the ships bearing the formidable army accompanying him. After the British land and march across the barrier of the river, Using the Let Us Recall, Bendigide Fran's body as a bridge, it is Branwen who arranges for a truce between her sanguine and affinal relations, an arrangement to be ratified by the offering of a feast to the invaders turned guests. Unfortunately, Branwen's plans come undone on account of the chronic deviousness of the Irish and the willful destructiveness of her half-brother. I like to think that, given the depths accorded the character of Branwen in the text's presentation of her, the letter she wrote was more than just a plea for rescue, that it also offered an acute analysis of the situation and how she ended up in it. If she had gone to the trouble of teaching a bird how to talk to humans and thus presumably convey the message, why did the letter have to be produced at all? Perhaps here, as in the passage discussed earlier which highlights the transformation of Bendigide Franz saying into a proverb, the composer of the second branch is showing that he is interested not just in telling the story of some extraordinary characters living in a time, but also in saying something about the profound issues implied in the difference between fluid and fixed discourse, between the past as happening and the past as enshrined in hindsight, 
and between a talking bird that can fly over the Irish Sea, and a letter that, to do its job, must stay put, affixed to the bird. We should note that the oral bird and the written letter are not dispatched in sequence, but are sent off together, complementing each other and reinforcing the same message, imprinted upon each in a different way by Branwen, who is both writer and teacher. Perhaps it is with this dual accomplishment that Branwen, and the author of the second branch of the Mabinogi convey to us the essence of what the story has to say, that writing needs an accompanying of voice to reach its intended audience, and that communication, whether spoken or written, oral or visual, can never be completely stifled or robbed of its efficacy. This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Anchor. Breaker. Overcast. Pocket Casts. Radio Public. Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.